to record. So welcome tonight, and I'm going to spotlight Miss Jessica Abajar from New York City. Jessica, okay. welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hold on. Do I seem to have an echo? Not too bad. It's okay. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Just adjust some of my audio. Okay, I think that should be fine. Hello, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, my name is Jessica Abahar. Uh, I've been a member of the Sacred Dance Guild for um, close to 15 years now, Hi. and I'm excited to uh, celebrate every moment, um, enjoy um, just connecting with one another um, in sacred movement and um, excited to have connected to have connected with so many people and especially with um, our interviewee of today, which is Carla DeSola. Um, she has been an inspiration and also a mentor of mine. So I'm really excited for this opportunity. Um, so before we begin our session, I just want us to all take a moment. Um, if you can place your hands on your hearts, take a deep breath, and just allow ourselves to really remember who we are as one people on one planet dancing the beautiful dance of life taking our moment to close our eyes or lower your gaze whatever feels most comfortable for you taking a moment to breathe in together and breathe out. Okay. So once again, as mentioned, this is the Sacred Dance Guild sixth of a series of interviews with honorary members um, that we call our living legacies. And we will be asking our five important questions. And this is all um, part of our legacy project. So just a brief explanation about the project. Um, after 62 years of experience, the Sacred Dance Guild has decided that now is the time to create a process to accredit sacred dance professionals, facilitators, and to mentor and support those working in their communities in various areas of sacred dance. There are a number of aspects to the project. One of them is to discover some of the gems that those who have been doing this work for many years can share with those of us here in the present and be documented for those who will follow us in the future. That thought birthed the five important questions and the interview series. Originally, these were going to just be one-on-one -on -one interviews so we could record those jewels. But then with the technology available, we thought why not open it up to everyone? So here we are today. So we are excited um, to have for today's interview, Carla DeSola. Um, she has been an honorary member um, as part um, for, for quite some time. And so a little bit about Carla. She is a pioneer in liturgical dance, a dancer, choreographer, teacher, and author. She is a diploma in dance from the Juilliard School and an MA in theology and the arts from the Pacific School of Religion. Carla founded the Omega Liturgical Dance Company in residence at, uh, at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City from 1976 to 2008 and currently directs the Omega West Dance Company in Berkeley, California. Omega was founded to express the spiritual, human, social healing dimensions of dance, exploring inner aspects of movement integrated with the world's spiritual resources. Carla has taught classes through Pacific School of Religion and the Center for the Arts, Religion, and Education 
at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley for over 25 years. In 2015, Omega West Dance Company presented Beyond Words, an Interfaith Ritual for Peace for the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City, Utah. Carla has been a major presenter at many Sacred Dance Guild festivals and workshops and was one of the living legacies of the 50th anniversary festival at Connecticut College. We also have with us today, Sister Martha Ann Kirk, who um, is a professor at the University of the Incarnate Word. And she's been a longtime member of the Sacred Dance Guild and is also um, been part of helping documenting and also um, documenting the legacy of Carla through an archival site with uh, biographical sections. She's written for um, uh, a book with Carla's oral history. So we will also have Martha Ann a little bit later on open for questions later um, in our interview. But now before we begin the interview process, we have a clip here that we would like to show. Beyond Words is an interfaith ritual for peace, incorporating movement and chant forms from major religious traditions, woven together in the language of dance and prayer and music. It is a ritual designed to inspire participants to recognize the profound beauty and complementary nature of the world's diverse faith expressions. To move beyond words, which may be a barrier to understanding, opening those places in the intangible regions of our hearts and imaginations. Water, life giving to all, is a recurring theme in Beyond Words. The religious leaders process down the aisle in full garb, carrying vials of water, which are then poured into a common bowl. We hear about the significance of water in their tradition. The whole assembly experiences the teachings of the leaders through gesture and chant, rising, praying with body and soul. Singing bowls ring out peace. Pox, pay, pace, peace, shalom. Omega West Dance Company began as Omega Liturgical Dance Company in New York City at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in 1975. They are a group of lay, interfaith dancers devoted to expressing the spiritual, healing, social dimensions of dance in a variety of settings. Life-giving water of a river becomes the image allowing one faith-inspired dance to flow into the next. I would like to see this ritual offered in diverse religious settings, churches, synagogues, mosques, for large gatherings for peace and interfaith work. Interfaith prayer is vital at this time, and the arts are a bridge. It can open us to a word that is wordless, that carries us beyond our differences. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for sharing that clip. And um, before we actually begin the interview process, um, and before Carla begins talking about her personal journey, um, Carla would actually like to lead us all in um, movement and in prayer. So if you can please feel free to join along. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. I consider you part of my family. And thank you for coming. And thank you, Wendy and Jessica and Martha and Kristen. You don't see her, my friend. Let us um, stand up if you can. I mean, if you have the space. <laughs> and to invite the Holy Spirit. And just do it with me. Follow me. Come, Holy Spirit. All together. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Breathing in, send forth your spirit, and we shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Huh. Now, um, Carla, if you would love to share with us in um, however long you would like to, um, your personal journey in sacred dance. We would love to hear that story. Okay, well, I realize my personal journey in sacred dance is also so intertwined with my religious journey that has to go together. Um, and in terms of liturgical dance, think of the sacred dance as the overarching term and liturgical dance is within that, as part of that. And it happened to be my particular way, but always um, very sacred to me in terms of dance. Um, so liturgical dance began under the inspiration of the Catholic worker in New York. I was a recent Juilliard graduate and dance was neither sacred nor secular. Dance was my mode of artistic expression and been part of my consciousness since early childhood. I didn't study dance then, but I was always moving, moving, running down the halls, hitting the walls, playing. Dance was my mode. I was, I have a twin sister who's very fertile. <laughs> and I was, but she always would follow me in movement. I love that. However, part of going back to Juilliard, I must acknowledge the effect of my major teacher there, Jose Limon, and particularly his Misa Brevis, a beautiful work, which he stood down stage right corner as the figure of Jesus. And it was very moving to me. I was not Catholic yet. I was brought up in a Jewish but atheist home and converted to the Catholic Church shortly after graduation. I joined because I was on a spiritual search and I begun with my sister who had become a Catholic five years earlier and I needed guidelines and a place to worship. I said, I can't do this on my own. Um, and uh, an important part of that was meeting my godmother to be Beatrice Bruteau who introduced me to Teilhard de Chardin, a major uh, philosopher, paleontologist, and a great forward-thinking person within the Catholic Church. And he had the Omega Point, and that's why we later named the company Omega Dance Company. But after being discouraged, I became a Catholic, my godmother said, call up the Catholic worker in New York. Mm -hmm. um, there's something maybe that would be important for you there. And it began a new point for me. I went down there. There was a mass at a kitchen table. 
we all celebrated together. People, I realized, were going out after the liturgy to be arrested, <laughs> to be engaged actively. And I said, oh my God, this is the primitive church. Oh my Lord, what's opening <laughs> Well, it wasn't to be my major way, but I spent about five years down there really being um, part of that whole um, way of being and serving. Um, particularly important was I met someone there at the Catholic worker whose name is Philip, mm. or I called him Paul. And he said, oh, I hear you like to dance. Would you teach us? And I said, of course. Yes, you want to dance? And they were meeting in rooftops and all kinds of places. And I love the opportunity to dance there. And then he said, well, let's do more. And we love to dance, but he wasn't trained. And here I am, a lot of tons of training behind me. But when I saw him move and pray in movement, I said, I can't do that. Mm. I don't know where that movement comes from. It's beyond me. I was watching and I said, he is in a relationship to God. He is not only moving, but he's listening. Mm. Profound insight for me in terms of sacred dance. And then he said, let's do an experiment. I'll read a gospel story and you dance it and we'll hang out bread and wine, or not bread, no, bread and honey. And somewhere in New York, in, in the uh, alleyways here, uh, all kinds of odd places, down, down on the Lower East Side mostly. And it was very exciting. Um, I still use that material years later in workshops, teaching workshops. Jarrett's daughter, getting people to say, only believe, only believe. And then we'd all start rising from the, um, from the sidewalk. <laughs> it was very mm -hmm. exciting time. And what I learned from him in terms of sacred movement. About that time, I had gone on a walking trip with him, carrying, he was like a St. Francis figure. And we were living in a very, um, uh, like a brother and sister relationship there. And we walked mm -hmm. in the countryside with me dancing. At <laughs> and, um, and I said, I've got to get back to New York. I was invited to dance for the artist NYU, and it was the first time I was asked to do a liturgical dance in a regular church. This was the mm -hmm. artist mass for the Feast of Christ the King. <laughs> now, who is Christ the King? You know, I have to go down the aisle, but what type of king? I had just passed down there, someone draped over a garbage can. I said, this is Jesus. I've been walking, walking, walking. And so when I walked down the aisle and took a first step, and then a second step, and then another step, a big smile broke out in my face. It was a serious moment, but I was smiling. I said, I have found my work. This is my vocation to do liturgical dance. And I knew it from also having experimented with the dance the Assumption of Mary, which was the, right before that feast day uh, in August, and it was in dancing that, just in my living room, uh, not even a studio yet, and I put on Forage Requiem, the Adiesi, uh, Paya Yezu, and I arched my chest on the floor, my heart reaching upward, and I said, I know what this mystery is about. I learned it through my body. Mm. Those were just key, key memories of me, of for me, of the whole thing that, that was. Then later I moved uptown and met my husband, Arthur, and I said, I picked up right here. Uh. <laughs> and we knew the dean at St. John the Divine Cathedral, who said, Yes, build a studio in the crypt. And we built a pretty art studio in the crypt of the cathedral through Arthur and it made a wooden floor and um, and it's continuing not there but to this day um, there's an Omega I call them East dance company after I came out here but we had a free studio for 25 years and the highlight probably was doing the earth mass 
Uh, those of you who were there for other things I've done, uh, is it, is it uh, Martha Chapman or Martha Ann Kirk that has this wonderful video of four and a half minutes of the Earth Mass. It was uh, always done for the Feast of St. Francis with animals and dancing and singing, and it, it's a wonderful occasion. Now we go on, let's see. Um, okay, um, during that time there, uh, I met uh, Father Thomas Kane, Tommaso as we called him, and he became a benefactor of the company, and he took us as a group to Ireland, to a peace conference there, on the Beatitudes, it became a favorite scripture of mine, dancing the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. He took us to Avignon in uh, France, and we did a huge circle dance out there, and I love, to this day, doing circle dances. I'll get more into that as something we should all do. But um, I was brought up in a, a Jewish atheist home, as I said, and Sephardic and in influence, if there was a little bit there was. I did go now and then to a city college where I was for a couple of years to Hillel, and I learned a few Jewish folk dances. I love them. I love folk mm. dancing. And that's part of who I am. And I think the more dance you know, the better. All kinds of forms of dance. But to this day, um, at the end of the liturgy, having people go out of the church, processing down the aisles, circling around, forming a spiral, unspiraling, making a circle, coming to the center, um, that's become like, I'll get into that in terms of community, forming dance and community, and it's usually part of the peace work too. So let's see, um, that's the Paulist, uh, Dancing for Peace, um, I was reading recently a line from Brother David Stendhal Rast. Now, there have been two, several monasteries that have had an influence in my life, and he's a Benedictine from Mount Saviour in Elmira, New York, and he wrote this line I read last night. We have a spiritual spine and can get up and dance. Isn't that an amazing sentence? Our spine is spiritual, get up and dance. This is a monk saying this years ago. He was also part of a wonderful experience, uh, which was a 10-day silent re yoga retreat. And he was there, and uh, I was invited by the Catholic priest, and there was a Rabbi Gelberman, and uh, Swami Satchitananda was the main leader. And that got me interested in the interfaith work very much there. Father Maloney, uh, he had me dancing at the liturgies every day, the Catholic liturgy, but everyone was, was some switched at such Tananda doing yoga. So doing yoga, later Tai Chi, that's part of my spiritual journey in terms of the sacredness of movement. I'm sure I'm forgetting things. Um, I make a West out here. Um, so, okay, now I'm of course interested in passing on. Um, and all of, we have many teachers. Our bodies, our heads, our souls, the spirit, all of life, never to limit God's flow of grace. Okay, I think that's enough on spiritual journey. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, just touching upon your um, journey, it's just wonderful to hear the um, sort of direction that it went in and I'm just so moved by it, <laughs> but um, just to move on to talk about, especially the idea of creating sacred space. I think you've touched on really interesting points. Um, um, I'm just really touched by the story of your time at Catholic, at the Catholic Worker House, and you talked about mass being on the kitchen table and then being part of sort of like a primitive church and that how you started dancing in the alleyways and on rooftops and then one of your you know first major connections was to or um or, or sort of sort of awakening to your vocation was when you got the opportunity to dance um within the church and so I wanted to ask, and um, just to ask, what are your thoughts on creating sacred space 
and we touched upon all these different spaces. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. Sacred dance begins within. I think that's important because that's what you carry wherever you are. Sacred dance begins within. And so I have here in my notes, it says indoors, outdoors, site specific. A lot of liturgical dance is certainly site specific, right? Mm. Um, indoors, outdoors, uh, creating sacred space is actually easiest for me in all the workshops and classes I've done. Um, because we can begin with prayer, begin with moving together. I always ask people to move around the space. Now, it could be in the dance studio, but it could also be when I have them go to different houses of worship, that we don't just do a dance there, but we move around the space, feeling the relationship of our body to that space. And I still do that now and then, even in the, the later days. Um, and in a church, there's lots of already, you know, a sacred altar, many things at St. John the Divine, there was space, it's a huge cathedral, and there were different sacred spaces all through it, much to explore. There's also the sacred space of a, of a little candle in your living room, kneeling in front of a table and creating that sacred space. Um, but back to workshops. So we would interact, I would have them mingle with each other and that's enormously important. Sharing simple movements, greeting each other, um, bowing to each other, and always with a sense that everyone is precious, does not matter the level of technique, really reverencing, holy, sacred, each person. And then maybe at the end of such a session, we form a sculpture together that would emphasize our, our togetherness in this sacred space, creating that in the workshops. Um, I don't have much time. There's only in a workshop or class where I see someone over and over. I introduce something from using lines from a Quaker, George Fox. Mm. Sound deep. I have to go back and wait a moment. Um, uh, sound deep to the witness of God in everyone. Then when your feet be beautiful, that publish peace. Sound deep to the witness of God in everyone. We would go into twos, bow to one another. One person would move, I'd put on music, and give them a line from scripture. Like, where are you, God? The other person would hold them in prayer. Not judging, holding in prayer. And then they would reverse and embrace one another. But that certainly helped create the space of the twos and then share with the whole mm. class. Um, as I say, there are many things you can do in a class, in a workshop. When we're outdoors, of course, there's the sacredness of the whole landscape and the beauty. Um, I would like to quote from Teilhard de Chardin, his hymn to the universe, the sense of the sacredness outdoors. Lord, that I might hold to you the more closely. I would that my consciousness were as wide as the skies and the earth and the peoples of the earth, as deep as the past, the desert, the ocean, as tenuous as the atoms of matter or the thoughts of the human heart. Mm. That's certainly God's presence in space. We had the honor of dancing that at a Teilhard conference uh, somewhere out in Santa Clara, I think, a few years ago. That's a sense of presence. So from the tiny candle to classes to rehearsals. Now, in rehearsals, there is a bonding, too. But we'll get to that later in sacred community. What about the sacred space that Miriam created? Space between the waves. <laughs> dancing between the waves. This was an exodus and they had to take just what was important, but the tambourine was important. So she led them in the sacred space, down through the waves or dancing before the ark, creating the sacred space with the ark. Anyway, we can go on and on. A sacred dance skill pioneer, Martha, uh, uh, what's her name? Um, uh, 
uh, you know, I mean, Margaret Taylor, this Taylor, Time to Dance, has a ton of history on this. There are many mm -hmm. other books, but since she is one of the founders of the Sacred Dance Guild, I thought I'd mention her and all her history from the ring dance and the angels to all kinds of holidays within the village. Okay, I think that's enough for the sacred space. Begin with within. Thank you so much. I, that that's I really love that the um, starting within that sacred dance begins within and uh, I mean to connect to our next question. It's kind of wonderful to see that there's an interconnectedness between sacred space and community. So this is a great segue into our next question and just asking about what are your thoughts on sacred community. I know. You had an explanation for what it's like in workshops. Would love to know also um, just creating sacred community within uh, rehearsals and groups. And maybe perhaps is there a different feeling that you have when you're participating versus when you're leading? Would love to know your thoughts on community. Certainly when participating in class or rehearsals, there's a vulnerability. You're dancing, you're doing your best. That's an important factor because we have to honor each other and bring out the best. And that helps create a community. I also like us to pray together. They say it's harder in a rehearsal because you've got a deadline and I have such a tendency <laughs> to want to rehearse, rehearse. Um, but it's important not to, to start with a sense of prayer and can really creating the community by warming up together. It's part of the way mm. of creating the community together. Sometimes I have each one share a favorite warm up. And at the end of a rehearsal, it's important not to dribble away, just mm -hmm. to leave, mm -hmm. to do that with closing prayer, giving thanks. I often forget that. <laughs> um, but there's that sense of when you have performed together, I mean this in the best sense of the word perform, not putting on a show or an act, but um, creating this moment together with the dance, that creates community, my gosh. You know, it's, it's, you have bonded that way. Um, a challenge is creating community with the congregation. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you ask, will you dance or your company of more professional dancers, but not us? But it's very important, I think, to really connect with the congregation. And I've been trying, off and on successfully, for years, for years. Because then they are part of the dance. Mm -hmm. so you are dancing to them. You're not dancing to them. You're dancing for them. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. them, it's for them and with them. And then it's wonderful in terms of community. Uh, we used to do it um, at Newman here in, in Berkeley on Easter Vigil at the end, just circle around the altar all together to a lot of the dance and process. Uh, I don't know, oh, we didn't process out, but many times I'll have people process out for different occasions. Uh, um, let me see, let me put the notes I had on community. Um, and as I say, the processing out is. Uh, and moving together in circles and then coming together to give thanks is, is wonderful. Okay, I think that's enough for community. No, thank you so much for that answer. And I just wanted to touch about um, just an observation. I know you're saying like we're not dancing to them, but for them and with them. And um, as also being in a Catholic, it reminds me of sort of uh, it's that prayer right before communion through him, with him, and in him. Um, and I think that's really, uh, really connects with dancing as well. So, I you know, just very touched by that and just uh, inspired by that as well. Um, I Jessica, thank you. Yeah. It's called, there's a term called perichoresis. It mm, means mm -hmm. the ring dance of the Trinity. And that's a community. It is a ring dance is the image of, of, of the Godhead. And people mm. are dancing 
And, and, and I think they're flowing one to another, as we all are in this ring dance, perichoresis. Mm, mm -hmm. More on that, a study, whole study on that, maybe. No, I, yeah, I know. We can talk about that forever. <laughs> I mean, like, I love that, the idea of flowing just with, you know, one into the other, and that's what creates the deeper relationships and, I mean, deepening the community and, in essence, to go back, um, creating the sacredness and space. Yeah, and, and the, creating the community of the circle dance of peace throughout the mm. whole world. That's the mm. final image. That's the whole thing that uh, it's not like a tight little group of three, <laughs> but it's finally the whole world, you know, as an image of peace and dancing together. And, mm -hmm. oh, that's a great image. Love that. So on to our next question. How does the sacred manifest through movement and dance? Which I'm pretty sure everything that we'd spoken about um, had been answered in this way, but specifically we want to talk about your work, your daily practice, and again, just in community, how, how those either differ or have sim similarities and or a common thread. Just your thoughts on that. This interests me because I, how do these things come about? I take time to breathe, light a candle, I'm lucky I have a dance studio. Mm -hmm. So what I actually do begin after I light the candle is I play music that inspires me, different kinds of music. Um, I like Hildegard very much to move to. I also like something called Meditative Chants and Prayer of uh, uh, Irish uh, John Philip Newell. I like El Hadra, that's the meditative sounds of the Sufis, Golden Bowls of Compassion, poems I use actually for Tai Chi work. But then I get in touch. I don't choreograph or warm up specifically right away. I breathe, I like the candle breathe, and move around the space. Mm. That puts me a sense of just who am I today? Where am I today? Mm. I, mm -hmm. I move around, shake out, but I'm just moving to this music. Things coming that I'd never think of with just my head. It has to be spontaneous. And after a little bit of that, and I say, okay, I, I do about 20 minutes of floor work from a modern dance background, and I have a bar, you um, can't see it right now, and I, I uh, uh, do sort of ballet bar. Mm. Oh, even for years and years and years. I, I do that almost every day. I don't feel complete without it, also I'm afraid at this point in my life and age, if I don't do that, I'll never move, <laughs> if I have to do it. So, but that's it. It's then that I might say, okay, what is the assignment? Uh, mm -hmm. How do I begin to use the um, training I have? What are elements of, of rhythm, of um, uh, a, a diff a different exploring movement from a more uh, choreographic way? Um, but Part of um, how does the sacred manifest through movement? I think it's really important, perhaps for a liturgical dance, if you're working with the sacred text, to really um, know what is your intention? What has been your research on that? You don't want to just give literal movements to something. But what is, like, for instance, um, where is God? Because people can always have God is up. Yes. But God is also down here. God is among us. So thinking about what, what, uh, what do I convey? What is my intention in elucidating through dance, prayer, or anything? So the levels of consciousness there. Um, let's see. Um, I'm looking for that kind of guidance. I'm also looking for just my body to inspire me. And very mm. much music. Well, let me tell you a secret. I sometimes play music that's not even the music I'm supposed to choreograph to. If I think it's going to give me an inspiration for what yeah. I'm not being told to choreograph, I'll put on something else because I want to find something. At <laughs> uh, any rate. Um, so I love being able to create simple movement for prayer groups, house churches, just bowing to one another, and and 
whatever. <laughs> um, when you practice in your community, I, I think that's enough for there. You know? Thank you for that. Okay, so this one's a, a very big question. Why do you do what you do? Uh, I remembered when I saw this question, a quote from an <laughs> Indian, I think he's a painter, Jyoti Sahi. And it's not exact, but it's something like, I give back to the church what the church has brought to life in me. Mm. And, and that's a sense of gratitude. However, I also do sacred dances in concerts. And that's because I love to create dances on many different kinds of themes that not all always liturgical. Um, but that sense of, of gratitude and giving back and wanting to explore what, after all, what keeps me most deeply connected to my inner paths, you know. Um, dance prayer keeps me in touch with the mystery of God with my life force, my deepest self, as well as spontaneous self. And now is the time to enter a deeper level of wisdom through stillness and silence. I was thinking just last night, we all know the line at the still point of the turning world, and it's the dance. But to find the still point is to enable the dance. And that is something I have a challenge to do. I move a lot and I need to get very still. Remembering years ago, St. Andrew's Priory in the desert, St. John, uh, St. 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 What is it? Uh, the Abbey there. Uh, mm. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I'm trying there. to remember. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and the priest there in charge of us would send us out each day into the desert. And that was a tremendously enlightening, grounding, finding movement within the silence of that time in the desert. Then we would create a dance. So why I do what I do is because it resonates from childhood on with my deepest sense and expression of who I am and who God is through dance. Thank you so much. And gratitude. Um, oh. Um, okay, so on to the next question. If there was one thing you would want to convey to those facilitating sacred dance um, events or to sacred dancers in general, what would that be? I found a quote somewhere from Kabir. Wherever you are is the entry point. But your preparation, I'm adding, this is your whole life. And let all movements come from a flow of grace. So pray and dance each day. Something, something. There's a transformation that's taking, yes, Martha. <laughs> pray and dance each day. There is a transformation that is taking place in our own bodies. And that's one of the goals of all our meditative techniques and methods. The transformation of the body and soul by the power of the indwelling spirit of God. The transformation of body and soul by the power of the indwelling spirit of God. There's a priest in a here, um, uh, may our bodies become outward manifestations of the divine spirit. Thinking from a book I'm reading of Sigli Siglio, Prayer in the Cave of the Heart. So, my own words, our bodies becoming outward manifestations of the divine spirit. It's a grace, a gift, an honor, and whatever we might think, how successful or not, it doesn't matter. We are in the flow. Mm. But do something each day to discipline involved. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all those answers. And um, I'm sure everyone has been very touched 
by you sharing your story, you sharing your truth, you sharing your light, and um, may this work continue and be inspired by your work, by your legacy. And we uh, thank you once again for taking this time to uh, for this interview. Um, and I think we'll now open it up for right. questions. Thank you. Uh, th yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Just your praise. To begin with a prayer, let's end with praise. Thank you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank Carla. You. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you both Jessica and Carla so much for just taking the time tonight to have this kind of dancing dialogue. I so appreciate these opportunities because they really don't happen that often. We think they do, but they don't. The time to just sit down and have the conversation. I have a question that is coming in and it says, Carla, do you have any experience of sacred dance? And I know you already, I know you do. So I'm going to, uh, for death and grieving tell yeah. us your story well for death and grieving yeah yes um well my, uh wendy my beloved author my husband yes, there he is. Yeah. i did create a dance for him and um it was very therapeutic to create that dance and i did the show it at the sacred dance skill um but when someone else in my family died, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. I just put on music and dance and dance and dance. Mm. I put on music that was very emotional. It came to me who the composer was in a minute. But Gorecki, 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 not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but it was a lament that I needed to just improvise and pray with that um, through movement. Over and over, over, it was time to lament. So I say to when if there's a death or something like that, move it through your whole body. It's you have to connect with it, and in doing that, there is a release that comes from the honoring of your emotions. Um, I'm trying to think if there are more formal things. I know I've come down an aisle with ashes. Sacred ashes. And that's the heart. And so, for dear friend Beverly Paul, her husband died. Um, that's just a question, but it's a sacred procession. Yeah. Well, it's on my mind. Thank you for that question. It's important. It is very important. I have another mm. comment. It says uh, someone, uh, Joan, I think it was, was blessed to spend time at a workshop at St. Andrew's Abbey with okay. you in the 1990s. And she's wondering if you ever visit there. I did with John West and Martha was there, Martha and Kurt. What do you miss that? Um, I love mm -hmm. the place. I'd love to go back again. Uh, it's just hard to get there now, and I'm not flying right now. But I expect I'll be back again. Yeah. Uh, this was what works out with John West. Yes. One of the in the Sacred Dance Guild. And he took workshops for many years ago. <laughs> when, uh, I the funny things about it. A week in the summer. He did. So I Maybe I can find a way to get back. We have another question. Um, what are some of the sacred pieces of music that you might recommend for beginners, people who are just coming into this world to get in touch with the sacred? Are there something, are there ones that you might say, these are the ones that maybe would help you? Well, I mentioned that one CD, either, um, I don't know if you have to be that Christian, but it's the Dance Meditation Dance by Newell. It's both words and both music behind it that sort of is a way of praying as I'm improvising and warming up. John Philip Newell, N E W E L L. I play Hildegard a lot. Um, uh, those are just who I happen to be at the moment. I have stacks of CDs. <laughs> um, sometimes maybe a painting of um, medieval music. Maybe, but maybe you need good drum music. Uh, it's, it depends on where you want to get to. There's not one thing that's more sacred necessarily than another. It's what does your soul need? 
I would play a beautiful Magnificat. I have to go and get it. I've forgotten the name of it. Really, I think she's a um, Italian singer. But she wails the Magnificat. My niece has been very sick. And we thought she was dying. It's a miracle. She's been recovered from after five years of hospice. I was on the phone with her this morning. I got difficult on for her because she had another hospital thing and she's home at work. And I was just praying that I her. Her name was called Maria. Mm. Wonderful. Um, are there, here's another question. Are there certain places in your body where you especially feel the Spirit of God? I feel my heart is engaged. Like, uh, like when I was in the um, I remember even as a dancing, going to different studios, and if the upper body was just there, and there was no movement, that's why I like Jose Lamont so much. There was no movement in the upper body, so that the heart was engaged. Mm. Um, let's just do this together. Let's bring our arms up together. So this is fifth and open. Step in and bring the heart. Oh, that's important to me. I do a lot of prayer movements with hands, all uh, kinds of things. Um, I was just learning the, uh, the Spanish way of warming up the hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole torso. Uh, curling in and opening. It's the feeling just connecting the heart onto the mind. Just bring the, bring the mind into the heart and stand before God. So standing with your whole body present, feeling the presence of the divine mm. Standing, rooted, your spine lengthened, the top of your head receptive, open, wherever your arms are. Mm. Your mm -hmm. Wonderful. I will say to all of you that Carla, at the front end of this interview, said, I don't want to talk too much. I'm like, Carla, this is an interview. You're supposed to talk. But for someone <laughs> like Carla, we all know that her voice is through her body and her movement. And those of us who have experienced her in the person know that that's what it's about. So I totally understand that for her to just give us words is so limiting where her whole life is through what she gives us through the body. So, Carla, we are so appreciative of who you are and what you have gifted each of us personally. Jessica, do you have any comments you want to kind of give to us? Um, I just think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, hold on. Yeah. This is just an incredible opportunity. I think, as you'd mentioned, that we don't get too often to sit and talk too much about our movement. We're always just moving. <laughs> so it's kind of really nice to really um, have the opportunity to use our words and to be able to articulate uh, this, our stories and our journeys and, and to especially to hear uh, um, from Carla, from her entire not just career but it seems like the life journey that you have taken and to be able to um share that with us in both words and movement um it's very much appreciated and again in the in the interest of legacies of um it will definitely carry on the spirit and your um I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, your vocation will be very much felt by many people um, who will hopefully be open to their own vocations and carry out the work. Thank you very much, Jessica. You represent the younger generation and there's Omega back east, so they're going to be doing all kinds of new things over there. Omega West, I hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Oh, 
Um, Martha Ann, and Martha Ann is with us tonight. Martha Ann, would you like to say a couple of words? She has done so much work in documenting and archiving the work of Carla de Sola. So I'm just going to put her on the spotlight for a moment, Martha Ann, just to hear what you have to say. Oh, you need to un unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. The question touched me about dance in the face of grieving and death. And if everyone would look in the chat box, I put a link to a little chapter of the collection on Carla, where she talks about several dances and there are also pictures there. And Carla, I think you have done wonderful work helping people in the face of death, wonderful dances to help with grief. So I invite everyone to look in the uh, chat box and uh, I have Dancing in the Face of Death, read this chapter on Carla's work. Thank you, Oh, you're welcome. You are welcome. And also in the chat box, I put an article that I wrote for the Sacred Dance Guild Journal, which is posted online, yeah. which has links to Carla's dances for different seasons of the Christian year and other links to some of the dances that she has been mentioning tonight. And uh, Wendy has been so good posting all these in different places, but I'm just going to mention again that with the assistant of my wonderful graduate research assistant, Ivan, there is a YouTube channel and about 28 examples of Carla's work is posted on the Carla de Sola YouTube channel. And uh, Carla, you, you have something for us in every season. You have something for us in the challenges of life. Your movement gives us hope and inspiration and sparks our own creativity. Oh, thank you, Martha. And I'm going to, Carla, we're going to give the last word to you. If you were to give us all, I mean, you have so much wisdom and we're so appreciative of having you in our community and so grateful that you have given your time and, and spent, I, I want to say to everybody, Carla spent a lot of time thinking about these five questions. It wasn't just like tonight she popped on the, the, the website and said, let's answer them. Carla thinks about everything she does and I so appreciate that. One thing that occurs to me when they can, dancers need to be asked to dance. They need to be challenged. I said, would you do a dance on this and that? I mean, because I, I wouldn't just do it on my own, but someone said, oh, would you do a dance for this Jewish Christian conference and pick a Jewish woman? And so I did a dance on Anne Frank, which was like, to me, such an important dance in my life. Yeah. I think of Anne Frank because an older sister of mine oldest sister folk, um, who my mother had taken in when she left Nazi Germany, died from sleep. And she had taken up with us. She's way up in upstate New York, Lily. And she had come down to South Carolina at, and she was at this conference. I didn't know it. I come down the aisle with Anne Frank. We let out the walk. Uh, the capital finally, I mean, the, the, the secret annex was, was invaded. And there is Lily. She comes into the aisle and hugs me. She's up all I'm mentioning this because of her recent death. Um, so she was very, very precious to me. Sorry, I don't want to end that. No, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give the last word actually to Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on for a moment. I was like, I'm not prepared. Um, but <laughs> it's okay. 
Thank, thank you so much for everyone for joining in um, and listening in on this conversation. Um, again, just to mention, we're so often um, dancers don't have the opportunity to be able to uh, stay with words, to be able to articulate some of our thoughts, our journeys, and our stories. And so again, I'm really grateful for these conversations, for these interviews. And thank you for everyone for being a witness and for being um, open and to receiving. So much appreciated. And then I guess we can end in movement because that's what we do best. <laughs> so taking a moment just as we had done earlier, hand on the heart, feel free to close your eyes or lower your gaze, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Take a moment to breathe in, take in the world all around you, allowing yourself to connect to the world. Breathe out and allow a little bit of yourself out into the world, creating this deeper connection to one another, to this planet, to this universe, and to maybe perhaps something bigger. And thank you so much. Thank you.